Hi, this is Mike Hendrickson from Velocity and Fluent in San Jose. I'm here with Martin Woodward from Microsoft. Martin, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. It's been a great show. I've really enjoyed myself. So what have you liked about it? The level of conversations have been fantastic, you know. Just um, talking to people about the transition we made in the company from... Um, I worked, used to work on a product called Team Foundation Server, and then we took that product and, and made an online, you know, always-on cloud service called Visual Studio Team Services. And we had to go through that whole transition of taking you know, enterprise software, kind of, because it was built very much like an enterprise .NET and application. It getting it to the cloud. Yeah. And then the fascinating thing wasn't actually the technological exercise, you know, it's classic. It actually was fairly easy technology-wise, even though we went straight from um, an on-premises-based product to going full pads, full platform as a service, you know, breaking out to microservices, doing it properly because we needed the scale. Even though we did that, the technical bit wasn't the hard bit. The interesting thing is how we've been learning as an organization to become live site orientated, to become service orientated, and a completely different way of working. It's been a, a fascinating experience and to go to through. deploy changes and fixes and yeah. new, new versions yeah, yeah. continuously. Continuously, or, you know, and obviously that's where we are now. That's not where we started up. You know, right, right. We did our first deployment um, thinking, right, we're going to be always on cloud service. Did our first deployment. And then, right, right, let's do the next one. You know, nine months later, we'd finally figure <laughs> so it out. So you were on the, the delivery software method that had been around when we cut oh. CDs. And well, that's where I came. That's the yeah. history. I mean, that's where a lot of the organization came from as well. You know, we used to burning that. And that's very much of um, a mindset around meantime between failures mm. because it's expensive to shred CDs and things if you have a ship-stopping book. But now, when you're in an online service, you've got to fully, you know you should be meantime between failure. You know you should have a mindset that is how do we deliver quickly. But it takes a long time to, to know that you should do that and to actually internalize it and be able to do it as an organization. You know? So we've got to go through that change. We've gone from shipping every, you know, we then got, went to shipping every few weeks to be able to ship every three weeks to now where we ship into production multiple times a day. And so you're living what you're providing your partners now. Yeah, yes. and, and we provide it to customers. We, we use Visual Studio Team Services to deploy Visual Studio Team Services because it's the full you know, source control, work item tracking, release management. So we use that. But not only do we use it ourselves for, for customers, you know, for people with real jobs and like us, um, all of Microsoft are on it. So we've just been through a big transition where we've taken, it's now 69,000 engineers inside Microsoft and got them onto Visual Studio Team Services. So going from their proprietary build systems, proprietary everything, and every organization in Microsoft had their own way of doing things and try and get in all those people moved onto one cloud-hosted system. Where you're not throwing it over the fence to the other group. To yeah. The, the, yeah, exactly, yeah. where we're running it in a proper DevOps way. and. What's been fascinating about that is while they're not part of the team that run the service, we still have to involve them. They're still internal stakeholders. And, you know, if you hold up a Windows release, people get shouty at you inside Microsoft. You know, it's kind of important. Uh, similarly with Office and things and even Minecraft, you know. It's a lot of people want their Minecraft builds. Yeah. Minecraft yeah. are using VSTS. Yeah. So, you know, we need to get these out as well. So, um, and despite what it, I always say it feels in organizations, if you're in a big company, um, it always feels like the further somebody is from you in the org chart, the more stupid they are, you know, is how it feels. Um, it's not true, it, no. obviously. There's lots right. of smart people everywhere. And so we have to make sure when we bring them onto the platform, we have to do a lot of work around extensibility so that people could build plugins and extensions and very deep integrations into the, the core um, de developer tools collaboration services so that if they wanted something to do work a certain way. They've got two choices now. They can send us a pull request because we have inner source inside Microsoft now, which we never had before. Uh, so any engineering group can send a pull request to any other engineering group if they want to submit a bug or submit a feature or things. But what we tend to do is we have an extensibility model. So if the Windows team really want to invest in a particular dashboard or a particular type of feature or a particular integration with um, their telemetry systems and things like that, then they can build those and we give them the hooks to build them in, in because that's not a feature that we necessarily want to invest in for everybody or to send to consumers. You know, it's something that's very specialized to so, them. But is your inner source 
are they open source tools inner sourced or are they just all your tools inner sourced? Uh, the whole of the Microsoft code base is now inner sourced. Okay. So I can go and look and at. And grab a piece of. Windows. Yes. You yeah, can. I can. Wow. I, well, and what we Visibility we've, into it. Or visibility into it. Right. I don't have right. commit rights on right. it because right. it's right. inner source. Right. Right. And that was actually an interesting um, mindset change we had to go in through with the company because we had to go through a point where they were used to access to source control meant full access. You just didn't exercise it. And well, now we're working in you know, an, an open source style workflow, but inside the firewall. So you are, um, there are restricted read permissions, but, but permissive, sorry, restricted write permissions, but permissive read permissions. Read, right. So everybody can read the source code. I can read notepad source code. And figure out what's going on. Figure out what's right. going on, figure out what the issue is. I can submit a, a pull request to because maybe I want to finally add Unix line ending support into Notepad, you know? I can do that. I can submit that pull request if I want. Now, actually, I've looked at this as a hobby, you know, as you do, because, whoa, all this source code. Because you can. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Why yeah. not? It turns out that that was a really hard thing to do and would have impacted a bunch of systems. And turns out, you know, the reason why they haven't done that is because of all the knock-on impacts in terms of the way that the dependencies are set up. It isn't because the team that run Notepad were idiots. It's because it was a hard problem. Who Go figure, you know? And, and that's generally the case that happens. So, but we needed this extensibility model. And the interesting thing about um, inner source, this has come along at the same time. So my only claim to fame, really, inside of Microsoft, it's, it's such a big company, it's very hard to know if you've, as an individual, ever done anything. You know, you're just a cog in What a, is your contribution? Exactly, yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah. you just, especially as a, you know, glorified middle manager, you know what I mean? I delete a lot of email and, you know, make some PowerPoint slides, but what am I actually really doing? The one thing I, I can claim my claim to fame now is I was the person that created Microsoft's GitHub org, like it was me. It ran off my credit card for a little while and I had to expense it, you know, so I got that set up. Um, and now we're the biggest GitHub, you know, we're the biggest open source organization on the planet now. We've got the highest number of contributions. We've got, say, the top five open, you know, some of the top, uh, yeah, five of the top 10 open source projects and things. So it's a very, you know, very active presence in the open source community. And that was a huge culture change we had to go through as a company as well. But then seeing the things we're learning from learning how to work with open source seeing those translate into culture changes in the company with how we work with each other and adopting those collaboration models inside the business as well as outside the business. It's just been a, a great transition. So do you think that culture change has made people, people happier at Microsoft in their job? So it's, yes, there's two things that make people happy. Um, the, being, able, being able to influence and being able to you know, fix things and being able to change things, definitely. Um, and working in this inner source or open, and open source hugely makes them happier, especially open source because we, um, we very deliberately set it up so when people contribute to open source projects on GitHub, they do so with their personal accounts. Now, we have some tooling set up inside the company, which is open sourced, which allows them to associate their GitHub identity with their Microsoft identity so we know who they are as a person. And then that also allows them to get access to certain GitHub repos based on where they are in the org chart and things. So we have that tooling set up. And that tooling also does things like make sure they set Microsoft in their company name so that we're transparent about where this contribution is coming from. And things. But the, um, the, as they're doing these contributions into GitHub, it just helps them you know, understand how to work and it builds up against their personal profile. And it makes them, you know, they're like, look at this awesome stuff I've done. And I work for Microsoft, I'm doing awesome. And, you know, it makes them feel more successful. The other thing um, that they're really enjoying is, and it was proved, uh, there was data in the latest Stack Overflow survey, the 2017 Stack Overflow survey. They um, basically have correlated a happy developer as a developer that ships frequently. So the, so the check-in, check-out model, is it ship? Shipping, or, okay, shipping, shipping, having wow. a customer use your stuff. Not just checking in. Check in, check out, blah, whatever. The, that that doesn't make sense. Yeah, we've had that forever. Yeah. The, actually, shipping software and getting it into customer hands, the shorter time your mean time to release is, the shorter time you can, and, and you know, time for null ship sort of thing. The shorter that is, the quicker your iteration cycles are, the happier developers are, the more likely they are to stay with you. 
And so, and this is, you know, we've actually got data. This is what we've kind of known. Like, it, it's fun. It's so much fun getting people to use your software. We kind of know that. But we've actually sort of seen, you know, actual data that backs this up now, which is awesome. So, Martin, if, if you and I sit down yeah. next year here. Yeah. What would you like to say Microsoft is doing even better than your journey that you've already been on? Wow. Where would you like to see the organization next year um, at this time? Yeah. So we need to get better at doing open source. We're doing a good job today. Um, we're making, we set up our reward structure inside the company to make it such that people are actually it's in their favor to contribute back to the open source Which community. Great. Yeah, because yeah, they have to. Because if they're not contributing, it's not for karma or whatever. It's a pure business sense. If you're not contributing back to an open source library you're consuming, then you're forking further and further away. And it's, it's basically, um, it's like a, it's an integration credit card debt you're building up, yeah? And if you don't bring that, that if you don't push your stuff up, you can't bring that code right. back, and then you're not getting the free features. So why were you using open source in the first place? Why didn't you just build it yourself? You know. So anyway, we encourage people to do that. I like to just get better at doing open source. Um, generally, more uh, making sure some projects are very transparent in some you know ones that we run. Other projects uh, tend to be less involving of their communities. You know, they're publishing under an open source license and they're taking pull requests, but do they have community? ownership of it so yeah do some more of that and then the other area is around inner source there's a lot more features we can add to to make the coding experience inside of companies more social um, helping with you know learning from the pull request models and things that we support within visual studio team services um, making sure that uh, it's easier to contribute to things making sure it's easy to to take forks and then to integrate code back. So one last question, because mm. I'm very curious about this. Okay. With your inner source efforts, yeah. have you guys done any studies on are are the people who are checking in code checking in better code now than they used to? Because of so, the transparency. Not with, we haven't done that data. We haven't done that data with inner source. However, we have done that with um, I don't know. Open. Anecdotally, with open source, I see it yeah. all the time. Yeah, it'd be interesting to have some numbers. Yeah, yeah, that. yeah. I should, yeah, we should look at the measurements. Be, um, so I help a lot of groups open source stuff inside the company. And the classic conversation I'll have with engineers is, you know, we're coming to open source. Oh, hang on. Let me just refactor that for six months, you know. And you're like, dude, this code's been shipping on 8 <laughs> billion <laughs> devices for 10 years. Does it not, is it not good code? Oh, no, 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 it's great code. We'll ship it. And there's this whole, because it is against their personal reputation as well, mm. there's this whole emotional thing mm -hmm. about letting other people see it. Um, the other thing that it stops people from doing is, you know, we have deadlines. We have, you have a show coming up, you have a, a release to hit, you have a date to hit. Sometimes when you get those deadlines, you want to, like, check in, you know, some code you wouldn't normally check in with a to-do because you know you're going to come back to it and then yeah. you know you never do. But yeah, the to-do bit. These to-dos we found in the code base that have been there for 15 years, you know, it's, it's anyway. So you, um, you do that. You can't get away with that when you're open sourcing something because the community, when we open source, say, .NET, we don't consider something truly open source until the devs are actually, you know, when they open source it, they're no longer working in team services. They're working on GitHub that, and that's where they work. So when they do a pull request, they do a pull request into the open source repository. We don't, you know, that's where code reviews happen. So if you're contributing to .NET, you follow the same process as somebody on the .NET team does, right. which is how you do open source. Um, so when they do that, they get people commenting on pull requests and things, and they don't want, you know, somebody like, so we have, you know, um, Microsoft obviously huge contributor to .NET, but Google are a big contributor to .NET now. You know, Intel are a big contributor to .NET, Samsung are. And what you don't want as a C sharp developer, you don't want to check in a pull request and then have John Skeet pile in and say, You're an idiot, that's terrible code. You know, not that he would, because he's an awfully nice guy. But you don't want, you know, you've got all these people from Google and from different companies and from the community, and you want to check in code which is good. And so, yeah, we find, anecdotally, we find people definitely consider it a lot more. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what data we can get. Yeah, yeah. well, I look forward to that conversation yeah. in 12 months. Thank you very Thank much. You, Thanks for having me.